So good morning, everyone. Um, you know, we have, uh, we're grateful that um, Sean has been able to give us some time this morning to uh, kind of continue the conversation we've been talking about, um, which is ultimately how do we recruit board members? Uh, how do we kind of manage that board process and how do we do fundraising, you know, from, uh, from a perspective of equity and diversity. And so how do we do that? And so we say, well, we really need to tell the story. So, um, so we're going to start, this is kind of, what do we do to kind of, um, you know, how do we tell our nonprofit story? What are the things we do? And with this kind of in the back of our head, this kind of lens of uh, how do we do it from an equity perspective um, down the line? So, um, but before we do that, and we have a little smaller group today, I think maybe it's because we moved it from the third to the fourth Friday, but um, thanks for everybody being here. But why don't we just do the, the Brady Bunch intros real quick, just real quickly, um, who you are. And of course, we, everybody's got their names here so we can see everybody, but, uh, and just the organization you're representing and your role at that organization. Uh, so first, I'm Jeff Eaton. Uh, I'm the CEO of Arbor Housing and Development and one of the co-chairs of this August group and process. Uh, Lisa Karachi um, is the other co-chair and um, will be joining us um, in a while. So uh, why don't we just quickly go around. Um, Denise, I'm just gonna call it a first name and if folks could just quickly do that, we'll try to do that now 20, 25 seconds each and so we can give a lot of time to Sean. So Denise. Sure. Um, I need no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need no stinking introduction. Um, you can tell it's Friday, right? Greg. Yes. Greg Hi. Softly. I'm with Incubator Works in uh, Painted Post. My job is operations manager here, and uh, we are a nonprofit doing business startup and incubation and education. Thank you, Greg. Sure. Lori. Lori Ward, president of Finger Lakes Wine Country. Yes. Mr. Smith. Brett Smith, Director of Advancement at the Rockwell Museum. Thank you, Brett. Julie. Julie Chevalier, Executive Director with Community Progress Incorporated. Julie has the last name I would love, Chevalier. It's, <laughs> it's so romantic. Okay, Michelle. Paul Caulfield, CPP. Yeah, she forgets the big part. <laughs> She's the big gun, okay. <laughs> Ashley. Uh, at Incubator Works, Program Director for Corning and Alfred, and we do what Greg said we do. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Ashley. She just does it better than me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> nice small competition. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Dusak with the Orchestra of the Southern Finger Lakes. I'm the Managing Director, and we are going through our strategic planning process right now, so I'm glad to be on this call. What a fun time, strategic plans. Mm-hmm, my favorite. <laughs> Amy. Amy Jaffe, Creative Marketing Coordinator for Casa Trinity. Your volume is down, Amy, on your... Sorry, you know I had that same problem yesterday and it came out of the blue. Is that better? A little. Hmm. That's worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amy's just very soft. I'll put it in the chat. Oh, there you go. That's good. Amy's just, Amy's just very soft-spoken. That's right. Well said, Jeff. Jeez. Elaine. Hi all, I'm Elaine Spaker from Tanglewood Nature Center. Sorry, I was like, it's really windy out today and I just got in. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I should have stayed <laughs> off camera. <laughs> nice to have you here, Elaine, thank you. Linda. It'll be a little bit better unmuted. Good morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, what's new? The PRC is reopened. We're very happy about that. We're open for drop-in center play. And we're looking at uh, adding in our day camp and uh, some of our short-term childcare for the third quarter. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking of Elaine and anyone else that's doing day camp activities and um, looking for that state guidance on day camp regulations. So maybe I can enter the chat box, Elaine, and, and just see if you have any info to share. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. 
Sherry. Sherry Mandel, Clubhouse, Manager of Donor and Community Engagement. Oh, okay. Thanks for being here, Sherry, and welcome. Jessica. Yeah. And Jessica. No. Nope. Okay, let's move move to our co-chair, Lisa Karachi. Nice to see you, Lisa. Good morning, guys. I was having some connection issues. I'm not at home, so my computer is not happy with the different Wi-Fi, but um, I'm the executive director for Subang County Habitat for Humanity. Okay. Thanks for showing up today, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm handing off, my job is done. Okay, <laughs> so today we have Sean Lukasik on our um, call this morning and he's going to be giving us a little presentation on how we can um, do some better marketing, especially during these times. I think that it's more, even more important for us to be um, really good at telling our story and, um, you know, marketing, especially when we're in just a connected world and networking isn't really happening. So um, Sean is with Creagent Marketing and he is going to take it from here. And thanks for being here, Sean. We really appreciate you taking the time to uh, impart some knowledge into this group. Yeah, thanks, Lisa and Jeff and Denise. Appreciate the intros. It's good to see everybody again. I, I think I've met most of you, um, but to the new faces, um, I'm Sean Lukasik. I'm the owner at Creagent Marketing right here uh, in Corning. And um, we really specialize in digital marketing. Um, so everything video related, websites, social media. And a couple weeks ago through the chamber, I gave a presentation on social media trends uh, for, for 2021, which is a presentation that we do every year. Um, and uh, it's always interesting to have the conversation with um, a variety of, of businesses of different sizes, different industries. Um, and we usually have some nonprofit organizations in that presentation as well. But um, obviously today with everybody representing um, nonprofit organizations and uh, for the most part, relatively small organizations or smaller staffed organizations. Um, I'm really interested in, in continuing that conversation about social media trends, um, but then talking about how you can kind of capitalize on those to tell your story as we uh, hopefully are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of uh, a pretty rough year for, for everybody, not just nonprofits. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint or anything. Um, I, I asked Denise uh, when we first scheduled this whether the group was uh, a talkative one or not and um, she assured me and you all reassured me again this morning that you are in fact so I hope that uh, this can be more of a conversation. I'd love to hear um, as always you know what's working for you, um, what your specific concerns are. I don't think this group is so big that we can't talk about um, sort of specific case studies and that kind of thing either. So um, what I wanna do first is just go back to that presentation that I gave uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, there are several trends that are happening in social media um, and, and that we can kind of look forward to throughout 2021 as well. Um, and there, these trends are sort of pros and cons for, for this group, I think, for nonprofits in general. Um, the, the pros are that uh, purpose-driven content is more important than ever for social media users. Um, so having a stance on something, um, having an opinion on something, uh, having a cause that you represent, um, what, whether you're a business or a nonprofit or an individual or an influencer or whatever your role is as a content creator on social media, um, your users want to see purpose-driven content. So I don't really have to explain to any of you what that is, um, and you all represent different causes, 
Um, but, you know, in the past, I think uh, a lot of organizations and especially businesses and larger businesses were afraid to have an opinion or afraid to take a stance uh, one way or the other. And um, given, given the year that we've had, um, given the uh, social movements that we've seen over the past 12 months um, and that we can continue to see, um, it's no longer even acceptable to not have a stance on, um, on you know, where you kind of, uh, sorry, the organizations that you support in the world and the, the people and the communities that you support. So don't be afraid to put that out there. Um, another pro, I think, uh, especially for nonprofit organizations and, and businesses with smaller staffs is that um, users are, are seeing the value in just putting content out there and not necessarily seeing the highest quality production that they've ever seen. Um, and, you know, even when you watch cable news or uh, the late night shows or any sort of TV programming, we're seeing uh, people reporting from their living rooms. Um, we've seen, you know, it, it almost started off as blooper reels and now it's just common practice to see uh, a child running across the background while someone's giving a very serious update or a report on uh, CNN or whatever news station you watch. Um, and uh, so I think the, the production quality um, doesn't have to do with the value of the information that you're sharing. And uh, because we've had now a full year of a, a complete overhaul in the way that production is done, um, people are used to seeing those kinds of things. Um, they're used to not having the best audio in the world or the best lighting in the world. Um, but they still want to see your content and, uh, it's cheaper to do that with, you know, a ring light, um, and, you know, maybe your, maybe your earbuds so that it picks up your voice more clearly. Um, and to be able to deliver that content, um, is just what your audience is looking for. Now the cons, uh, some of the social media trends that don't exactly favor nonprofit organizations are that there's a big movement towards TikTok. Um, we see a ton of content. Um, even if you're not seeing it directly on TikTok, you might be seeing it on different channels um, where the production is done in TikTok and it's branded as such, but then it's being shared um, across other platforms like Facebook and Instagram or wherever we see video. Um, and this might not necessarily be a con for some of you, um, but the, the other trend is that uh, we're seeing that convenient content is more important. Um, convenient content is talking about things like podcasts um, and newsletters, the sorts of content that uh, people are going to in order to specifically hear from, uh, from a business or from an organization. Now, in your nonprofit, many of you, I think, already do newsletters um, and send them pretty regularly. Uh, that's good. Keep doing that. Um, people don't want to have to sift and sort through a ton of other posts um, or a ton of other content. The, the advantage of a newsletter is that it ends up right in their inbox. They can save it for later or they might miss this one and catch the next one. But it gives them a nice idea of what's going on. Um, and it's tailored to your brand and tailored to uh, all of your messaging. Um, and then podcasts, you know, two things are happening with podcasts. One, we see 55% of Americans um, say that they listen to podcasts now. So we're, we're over the 50% threshold. Um, that's hundreds of millions of people in this country alone. And uh, so if you have an opportunity to create one or to be a guest on a podcast or to advertise on one, um, now is the time to take advantage of that if you can and if you have that budget. Um, Spotify is testing out some new podcast advertising as well that could make it cheaper to get into that uh, arena. Um, right now, it's pretty tough because you have to go through a specific show or a, spe a specific host, um, and that can be pretty expensive because you're hitting one extremely targeted niche audience, um, and it can be time consuming as well. But uh, Spotify is making it possible to drop ads into previously downloaded podcasts um, based on region, based on interests, um, the same way that when you send a 30 second commercial to WETM, um, they just kind of drop that into a bunch of different programming. Previously, that has not been possible with podcasts. And so um, 
now that they're making it possible um, and it's not widely available yet, but uh, we may see a drop in the price of advertising and um, you may be able to hit more people in your niche or in your community um, without spending as much money as you did in the past. Um, yeah, thanks for the shout out, Lori. Um, I've done a podcast with Urban Corning and uh, I also produced the podcast for um, the Community Foundation, the Good Works podcast. Um, if you haven't checked that one out, that one's a lot of fun. They just dropped another episode two days ago um, talking about spring cleaning. Um, and they do often have guests on that podcast as well. So that's a good, a good example of a nonprofit in the region um, doing a, a pretty regular podcast. Now, uh, some of the hurdles I know exist for nonprofit organizations um, revolve around this idea that Facebook has become like an infrastructure for many of us. Facebook, it, it, it's been the, the place where we all kind of started. We all created our page and built our audience. And um, because Facebook integrates with so many other um, digital media, that's really become our digital marketing infrastructure. And everything's built around that. Um, and it, it feels like a really heavy lift for nonprofits to, to build another presence somewhere else if it's not somehow connected to Facebook. But that, not, that might not be where your audience is. You know, that might not be where you're getting your most engagement. Um, in a lot of cases, that's just where it's most convenient. And um, I've seen this idea that Facebook is sort of a moral economic fit. Um, and what they mean by that is, you know, it's, it's socially acceptable for you as a, a nonprofit organization or as a marketing professional to be spending your time and resources on Facebook because Facebook is widely accepted as the place that everybody hangs out, the place that people um, comment and engage and the place where it's easy to run ads. And so, it's easy to justify your time spent there, but um, you have to ask some questions if you're really trying to build your brand and get your messages out to a variety of different audience, which is how you're positioning your organization. If it's important to you to um, be affiliated or associated or even just mentioned by other organizations or businesses that are out there that are similar to yours, Facebook might not be the channel for that um, because there's not as much cross promotion and cross engagement happening there. Um, Twitter is a great tool uh, for calling, calling out um, people in your circle, in your circle of influence, um, calling out other organizations and tagging them and getting their attention and getting them to reshare your content. Um, and uh, it might not be as easy to kind of break into Twitter and, you might not see as much engagement in terms of the actual numbers. And that's why I talk about that moral economic fit because uh, your boss or your board wants to see um, those engagement numbers. They want to see those fundraising numbers, but you know, one retweet by a national organization or one retweet by um, a prominent celebrity or influencer um, that mentions you or that shares your content um, doesn't necessarily get you in front of the audience that you want, but it associates you with that audience. Um, there are a lot of organizations and people out there that build their brand better than we all do. Um, so, you know, if, if you're a, a small business here on Market Street and you get retweeted or shared by the Small Business Association um, nationwide, all of a sudden you become a model for small business um, where before you were just trying to, uh, you know, get shared by the Gaffer District or get shared by Finger Lakes Wine Country. Um, it just does more in terms of the prominence and the way that you're positioning your organization or your business. So it's something to think about in terms of how you're spending your time on social media. And then the, the obvious one is, um, you know, who do you serve? Uh, if you're serving a younger audience, um, you know, Corning Paint and Post uh, District um, is going to use Facebook, I would imagine, for uh, communicating with parents and guardians. But uh, if they want to reach their students, um, it would 
uh, they, they probably spend their time a lot more effectively on Instagram or TikTok um, or somewhere else uh, outside of Facebook. And the same might be true for your organization as well. Um, and you know, where are your growth opportunities? You might've maxed out your growth on a site like Facebook. Um, if you can reach a different audience with a different medium, um, if tourists are important to you and uh, you're trying to get their attention on uh, a TripAdvisor or a Yelp or something like that, um, you know, it's important to be active there. And if your fundraising champions, if your board members are the people that have real, real world influence in this region are uh, on a different platform or in a different group or run with a different circle, um, have an offline meeting with them and see how they might be able to help uh, generate some uh, new audience members or new followers for you. So uh, what I wanna do is kind of open this up, um, hear about you know, what's, what has been working for you um, or what has not, um, how you're trying to share your story, how you're spending your time, um, I know that there are different, uh, ways to justify your time spent when you're, when you're marketing your organization, it might be exposure. It might just be the numbers, the engagement numbers. Um, it might be money raised. Uh, it might be those, those specific bottom line dollars. Um, you know, in which case maybe TikTok doesn't make any sense because they can't click over to a, a, a quick and easy donation form where they, where they can do that on a site like Facebook or even Instagram. Um, and if your priority is uh, recruiting or um, even if it is fundraising, I think a lot of that does go back to branding. And a lot of that goes back to storytelling because whether someone's deciding to give money, whether they're deciding to participate in an event or if they're trying to decide um, whether they want to volunteer or be a board member, um, they have to know that, that the impression they have of your organization is in line with the things that they would normally choose for themselves or do for themselves. So building that brand um, is always important. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to that. And I know that that's the idea here when we're talking about storytelling uh, in general. So, um, I'd love to hear what's working for you, how, how you're telling your story, um, where you're seeing the most engagement around that, or um, are there things that worked uh, a year ago or a year and two months ago that don't work today? Um, I'd love to hear more about that. So I, the group, um... It's a little quiet right now. So all of a sudden but, they go quiet. <laughs> so, so I actually, so um, I've been taking notes and uh, this is this is good information, Sean. And then full disclosure, um, effort to be transparent. So Sean um, does our marketing and um, all of our social media stuff for Arbor Housing and Development and is actually helping us with our with our actually has created a new website for us. And so this is interesting conversation as we're going through this and how do we, how do we focus? We've actually made, I think some of those changes in our website in terms of how the audiences we're trying to approach and how we're designing it and how we're putting that together. You know, I, so, uh, you know, so you're talking through this stuff and I'm, and I'm kind of flashing back to our earlier conversations with, with, um, with, Brett and in terms of, you know, some of the things that he wasn't familiar of in terms of us old folks. And now I'm thinking, all right, we've got this new technology that I'm just not familiar with. And so when you start talking about things like um, TikTok uh, and podcasts and some of the other, you know, you, you really want to focus on Instagram for younger, for younger folks, et cetera. It's, um, it's all kind of, it's all kind of news, new to me. So the one thing that the, the two things that kind of stuck out for me, Sean, is I don't really understand TikTok, and I think your thought is maybe TikTok isn't. I think it was one of those um, might be a con in terms of using TikTok for for the work that we do. I'd be interested in hearing more in terms of you know your sense of of you know the value of TikTok and how would we use that if we were were to do that. 
And the other question is, um, so early on, you talked about if podcasts fit into your, your budget or spending plan. So, you know, how do you, how do you, how, if we were to individually create a podcast for organizations or hypothetically, I think we want to peel this apart. Let's say we wanted to do a podcast for the nonprofit, um, this nonprofit uh, roundtable group. And so we want, so, uh, so the chamber, you know, creates this podcast opportunity for nonprofits, and we start to create that. You know, how do you how do you do that? What's the cost? How does that work? And I think we want to peel that nonprofit podcast part a bit more. So, kind of TikTok and structuring podcast costs those kind of things. Sure. Yeah, I think I think the lesson in TikTok, um, if I could if I could answer that in more broad terms, is that. Uh, Video is incredibly important now more than ever. Um, and uh, TikTok gives users um, and content creators the opportunity to do some pretty quick and slick editing um, and to keep their, their videos under a minute um, and to be able to put music and other sounds in the background. Um, excuse me, they can add captions. Um, they could do quick cuts and, and uh, the sorts of things that the sorts of video editing tools that haven't traditionally been available um, on social media, especially um, we've seen video where it's just like one shot unless someone can edit it offline and then upload it separately. Um, and then Instagram immediately followed suit. So their, their reels, um, their watch reels are pretty much in line with that same kind of editing structure. So, all of a sudden, a lot more people have access to these editing tools and we're finding out that uh, they're actually pretty creative. They just didn't know how to use the tools before um, or they didn't have them cheaply um, at their discretion. And, uh, and what that is doing is it's putting um, very entertaining videos in front of uh, audience. And, and, you know, in TikTok, we, the, the, the users are much younger than on other social media sites, but they're not only young. And uh, when I get on there, I'm not creating content on there myself, not yet anyways, but when I get on there, um, the algorithms know that I'm not looking for uh, some of the things that, you know, teenagers are creating. Um, I'm looking at, uh, a professor from the University of Maryland that's talking about social media algorithms. I'm looking at uh, a golf instructor on the West Coast um, who just has a great style that uh, matches, that, that kind of fits with me and I learn a lot from him. Um, I see musicians on there that are creating little compositions in one minute or less. Um, and the more that you use the app, the more the algorithm knows that, you know, the kind of stuff that you're looking for. Um, and, but it's easy for TikTok or Snapchat or some other sites to get these, uh, um, to, to cause an impression that they're only for young people or they're just a bunch of people goofing around um, and they're not. And I'll disclose to you, you know, I, I was following this woman for a couple of weeks who was um, sharing a lot about social media algorithms. Um, and she is uh, a professor at the University of Maryland. She's got her doctorate degree and she helped create the algorithms herself. She was part of the teams when she worked at places like, uh, like Facebook slash Instagram um, and YouTube. And uh, I signed up for her class. I'm taking a summer course from her at the University of Maryland because of her videos on TikTok. So there's some real serious content out there. There's some, there's a lot to be learned um, and it's a connection to other content. And uh, I think that's the bigger lesson. Um, and, you know, with podcasting, um, it's kind of the same thing. You're able to really go in depth um, episode by episode. And, uh, you know, that's why I call it, I call it convenient content because I can decide as a user that, I'm interested in nonprofits in the Southern Finger Lakes, and I'm going to go really in depth in this podcast where they're represented and they're talking about their struggles that are unique to them. Um, and, 
when I'm just scrolling Facebook, I can't really choose to, to go all in on a topic like that. Um, but podcasting gives me an opportunity to do that. And, um, and then to listen to it while I'm folding clothes or while I'm out, you know, on a, on a road trip or something. So, um, it, I don't have to have the phone right in front of me in order to consume, um, content like that. What's the cost of creating that? So, I, so, so hypothetically, um, if, the, if, you know, this group were to say, gosh, you know, it'd be interesting to create a podcast around nonprofits and identify a topic around that we wanted to focus on um, in terms of getting our message out. Um, what would it take to create a podcast? What's the, you know, what, what are the cost factors of doing something like that? The real economic cost is uh, a few hundred dollars, um, you know, depending on what equipment you have nearby, what software you've already got, um, or if you're um, uh, consulting with, with an organization like ours, um, you know, you've got to have a place to host the podcasts. You've got to have, um, these days you have to have a tool to be able to record it virtually um, and get good quality audio from each of the guests. Um, and then uh, beyond that, you know, everyone here, I think, has some sort of their own infrastructure then. So once it's posted and once it's available, um, it can easily go out to different social media sites. Um, it can uh, be embedded just like a YouTube video. You can embed audio um, onto your own blog or onto your own website. Um, you can even embed a whole podcast feed onto your website so that it automatically adjusts um, every time there's a new new episode out there. So um, the economic cost is pretty minimal. Um, and, uh, and then it's just, it's the time to sit down and, and have those conversations and, um, and then upload them. You know, Sean, I think the folks on this call, a lot of them are very small organizations and even like Finger Lakes Wine Country, even though we seem big, there's just two of us. And so we have Carol Kane who helps us. Many of you have met Carol. She helps us. She helps in, in uh, Incubator Works. I know she's worked the show in the past. Um, but I think for this group, what might be important is for you to help each of us understand because you have limited time, resources, people to do this, um, experience, whatever. How do you decide if you have, you can't do it all, mm. you can't do Facebook and Instagram and a podcast and YouTube and TikTok and how, how does an organization take all of these potential um, social media platforms and say, these are the ones, I can only do two or I can only do three. How do, how do, how do we decide what we can do? Well, sure. that's becoming uh, less true these days because um, it's easier to post across a variety of, of media. Um, now you still have to go to each one and you still have to make the post. So it's still, you know, a few more minutes um, and those add up, you know, a, a half hour becomes an hour, 20 minutes becomes 45 minutes. Um, but uh, I would say to answer your question directly, um, make videos. If you have to set up exactly the way you're set up right here, talk into your laptop, talk into your phone, make a video, and that can easily exist on a variety of different platforms. Um, and it doesn't have to have an intro tag and an outro. It doesn't have to have your logo swirling at the beginning. Um, that's what all the branding on a social media page all around your video, that's what that's for. You've already got your logo there. You've already got the name of your organization there. Um, you're, you're, you don't have to, this video doesn't exist on an island. It's not a, a 30 second commercial where someone doesn't know what they're about to see or who they're about to hear from. Um, so you can create a quick 30 second video where you're breaking your mission down into little tiny bite-sized 
stories. So one day you might talk about uh, an interesting statistic or some research you did lately. You might share a fun fact. You might answer an interesting question. Uh, you could talk about how and why your organization started, why you're there personally, talk about your own story. Um, what's been your most popular social media post and why? Uh, who is your favorite volunteer this week? Um, and what did they do to help you out? Um, why does a large donor give your organization money? Um, there are all these different ways to just talk for 30 seconds about your organization, keeping it really mission centric, and then sharing that to uh, as many sites as you feel comfortable hosting to. Um, and as I said in the beginning, it doesn't have to be a high quality production. People are used to seeing us on Zoom. They're used to seeing professional uh, late night talk show hosts like Trevor Noah reporting, making, making jokes in his basement. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid of the production quality, especially if you're just posting on social media. There, um, there are some platforms that can help you manage multiple social media sites. Sean, do you have an opinion about which one is the best for that? It kind of helps if you don't have all that, all the time to visit all those individual sites. There's a platform that you can mm -hmm. post. It, to it does one. help. It does help if you're trying to cross post. Um, I don't. I don't usually recommend them because um, the posts are different across different platforms. So, for example on Instagram, it's widely accepted to put a bunch of hashtags um, and even on, on TikTok or Twitter to use a few hashtags to try to get some traffic to your posts uh, from people that might not know that you're otherwise there. But Facebook, hashtags don't make sense on Facebook. So if you write a post and you share a photo and it's got 10 or 12 hashtags on it, um, that might look great on Instagram, but it's gonna look really weird on Facebook. Now, if you're thinking about the bigger picture when you make that post and you think about sort of the lowest common denominator and I'm just gonna share one photo with a very simple caption um, and I'm gonna put it out there just to put content out there, that could work. You could use a, a, a cross-posting tool like Hootsuite. Um, I've used that in the past. Uh, or, or Sprout Social, that's kind of a, a more expensive software, but um, that's a good one. And, doesn't, uh, doesn't Hootsuite, when I used it, which was a long time ago, you can, you can put different content on each of your channels. It just mm -hmm. puts it all in one place so you don't have to log into all the different accounts. That's true, that's yeah. Good. So if it's more convenient to just have one website in front of you and not um, jump from site to site. Um, it could work for you that way. Um, I do a lot of posting from my phone, so it's, it's super easy for me to just jump over to the Twitter app and then bounce over to Instagram and copy and paste content, but then adjust it for, um, the medium where it's going. But, um, if it helps to have it laid out in front of you, absolutely. You can, you can do that and, and then still post, um, for the specific social media site that you're, you're going for. Can you guys hear me now? Sorry, this all yeah. this audio. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to like yell and then scare you guys. <laughs> um, so, and I don't know if this is like status quo of good or not, but I create all of our Facebook posts for a month and I create about between 70 and 85, depending. Um, but then I schedule them all out on Facebook so that they kind of automatically shoot out on times that I've seen our insights be kind of our peak moments, if you will. Um, but I leave Twitter open all day and kind of bounce between tabs just to kind of, because I know there's a little bit more grace as far as how you can use Twitter with posting more to it. Um, but that's been a helpful tool for me in the sense of managing all the things in that way that I can at least schedule out, you know, a bulk of posts to Facebook and I can even click it to Instagram as well when I'm scheduling it. We don't have Instagram for Casa yet, but um, it does give you the option to be able to do that. Um, so if that's, that's a little trick that I use. But. 
Yeah, scheduling helps, um, especially on a site like like Twitter um, when you're trying to tag other accounts. Um, just be careful with scheduling. Uh, remember that if something major happens in the world, if there's a major news event, the first place you should go is to your scheduling platform and stop everything because you do not want to post uh, how bad of a day you had uh, because your golf shot went errant uh, and, and you know there was a mass shooting in Atlanta or something. Um, and I've seen that so many times from so many huge organizations. Um, it's, it's almost, I mean, it is, it's funny, but it's really not in those moments. It is, it is definitely not funny, but yeah, I mean, it's helpful. Um, it's helpful to know that that's taken care of, um, and it's out there and you can always go back to it and change and adjust, um, based on what's important, you know, as your priorities shift. Yeah, that happened when um, the pandemic and everything COVID last year started. That was something where that drafts, saving it to the drafts from the scheduled was came in real handy of just kind of shoving everything into a bucket for a sense of what had been scheduled and then kind of like possibly coming back to it later or trickling it in once other things were kind of put out there. But um, yeah, I could totally see what you mean on that in that regard to it. <laughs> So I have a question, um, and I think maybe our discussion on uh, TikTok or a video that could be cross-posted might be part of an answer here, but um, I've just been with Nani Hood PRC for three months, so I'm still getting to know um, all of our practices and the history behind um, certain things, including how we handle social media. But I see that we have very high engagement on Facebook with our events and also through Facebook Messenger. And we have very low engagement on our regular posts, like, like two likes and one of them is mine. So, <laughs> so there's this discrepancy between that and we're not active on Instagram, which really surprised me because of the age of our target audience. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just wonder if there are any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's not just you. Um, that's on purpose. And that's because Facebook changes its algorithms all the time. And so does every social media site. And uh, when a site like TikTok comes along, and it's all video based, um, what Facebook does, and what Instagram does is they say, uh, we're going to completely prioritize this brand new feature that we just rolled out, which happens to look exactly like TikTok, but it's in the Facebook platform. Um, and we're going to make sure that that gets shown to every single person that logs into the app or onto the site. We're going to make sure that we move the, the button. When you log into Facebook now, um, right on the bottom of the screen, there used to be a little plus sign where you can add a photo and make a post. That's been replaced by, uh, in the exact same spot, a little icon that brings you to the Facebook Reels, which is their version of, or sorry, the Instagram Reels, which is their version of TikTok. Um, so their algorithms change to match those priorities as well, and to make sure that their users have an experience that they're catering. So um, Facebook doesn't really prioritize organic posts from businesses and organizations as much as they prioritize video or as much as they prioritize um, story posts in the little circle at the top um, and, uh, or, or even live, Instagram live uh, and, and Facebook live um, are prioritized by the algorithms. One of the things I just learned this week is that you can live stream a Zoom meeting uh, directly to Facebook while it's happening, or you can do it directly to Instagram while it's happening. Um, and so this meeting right now could be happening here in Zoom uh, and in real time be uh, live streaming on Facebook where people can then comment and interact. Or of course we can record it and I can share it to Facebook later um, as a premiere video where it kind of airs, it looks like it's live um, and then it just uh, sits on the timeline after that. So um, you could take advantage of some of those features. Those are the things that the algorithms on those sites are favoring. So it's not anything that you're doing wrong, Linda. It's not because your organic posts are terrible and 
your video posts are really good, it's because that's what Facebook prioritizes and that's what they want their audience to see. So understanding those algorithms is really important to making sure that you're um, doing an effective job reaching your audience. Any other questions? Thoughts? So one of the um, one of the benefits of being the, a co-facilitator of this group, we can we can raise questions and crazy ideas, and then we just say to Oh, Denise, mm -hmm. you make this happen, um, <laughs> and then Denise will offline say, Well, geez, Jeff, I'm not sure that's practical or not, but um, <laughs> So uh, offline, she'll say it right here. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll probably get a text in a minute too. So, uh, <laughs> but so so this actually, in, in, in full disclosure, is the kind of thing we we were just kind of bantering about uh, just a little bit. So, what, I'm curious about, um, and this is actually, um, in, in all seriousness, is actually, um, you know, Denise's idea or thought that. Would, so I guess there's a question to Sean and there's a question to the full group as well. Um, you know, would there be interest in um, developing a podcast around the um, Chamber's nonprofit roundtable? So for those of us who are part of the roundtable and for so the Chamber um, somehow sponsors or whatever um, podcast to talk about um, very specific things. I think, Sean, you mentioned earlier that, you know, really it's, um, you know, really it's really purpose driven now. So, so, so part of the conversation would be what is the purpose or what is the, you know, the outcome we want to achieve in terms of whether we're looking at, you know, recruiting board members or we're just trying to get our message out or talking about specifically what we're doing, what the impacts are, how COVID is impacting us or whatever that is. Um, is that is that is that something, Sean? That is a practical idea to do um, that could be worthwhile and um, productive. And then two for the whole group. Is that something that resonates to um, to you all? Is that something that say, geez, yeah, we'd be inter I'd be inter with no idea really how this would look, um, and whether it's practical to do it. Um, in, in all seriousness, is that something you all would be interested in participating in? Um, understanding there's a lot of nuances and questions with that. So Sean first and then the whole group. Yes, I think it would be worth the time. Um, I think it would be worth the effort. I would be happy to, to do it and help set up that infrastructure. Um, I think we just have to decide, you know, what, what is it called and, and who is kind of the host is the chamber, like the, the podcast host. Um, but Part of the reason why it's such an emphatic yes for me um, is not only because that's where a lot of people are going to get their content, but also because there are so many organizations represented in this group and that could benefit from a project like that, um, that we can all share it on our own channels and uh, get it out there quickly and way more effectively than if any one organization tried to build it from the ground up themselves. Um, so, you know, and I, I've got the, my own platform. Um, I manage the urban corning account and would be happy to share it through that as well, where a lot of people are used to listening to podcasts. Um, I know the community foundation, they have a podcast audience that they could share it with. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a definite yes for me. Yeah. So thanks. I and, and I'll open it up just as a um, important point. Um, I think is that when we were doing these live, um, the community foundation um, was the sponsor of, of the nonprofit roundtable. So the fact that they have that they're they they have a, a podcast set up or or have done podcasts and um is is important and it would be good maybe to have that that conversation with randy um so there's i mean the community foundation is still a sponsor of the nonprofit roundtable although now that we've gone we've gone virtual there haven't really been any expenses or anything that you know that um that randy had agreed to 
to offset just so we could get together in person. So that would be an interesting conversation to have as well. But so for the whole group, thoughts, reactions to that, to a nonprofit roundtable podcast. You know, I think one thing that would be very, very interesting here, if you look around our little Brady Bunch screens, we have representation from education, from the arts, culture, um, we've got uh, uh, addiction services, human services. I, just even this small group is is a is a wide, hugely wide variety of of representation of our community, and a lot of people don't really understand what a nonprofit organization is. I mean, I represent bringing people to this region and branding this region. I. I would love that because it's not if 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 Lisa were to do one just for habitat, it might get a little old and a little tiring. But the variety here and using nonprofit as that ribbon that ties us all together, I think would be really good. Yeah, and I think kind of to what you were saying about it kind of being a regional brand. I feel like now is really good timing for that too, as things start to open back up and people are actually allowed to travel, et cetera. It sounds like kind of perfect timing. It also offers us opportunities to um, get a, a, like a pressing need out there. Like I kind of liken it, what we're talking about to like an, ex has anyone been at a BNI? Yeah. Sean, you have, I know. Yeah. But kind of that first introductory period where, where you give the name of your organization, what it is you do, obviously expand upon that a little bit more. And then kind of you say what your greatest need is. Mm -hmm. um, kind of keep them um, like that. But what, what services you offer to the community? I, th I think it's a great idea. And I think it's a great way for us to co-market for each other too. I also love the idea. And um, so Tango Woods in, I mean, we are constantly trying to figure out, you know, how to, I mean, we've got so many cool things up here, animals and crazy stories. And, um, you know, we probably could do our own podcast, but we haven't. So um, we'd like to be part of this. And I was just thinking that I got a, um, a new grant opportunity from the Triangle Fund and it's a, they're piloting a capacity building grant program and it's up to five thousand dollars but um there's money needed it's there it, they have well professional development techno technological improvements um resource development which i think this would go under so there might be money that could help <laughs> we always need money for you know for sean for <laughs> equipment whatever so i mean there's i definitely think there's a way to to fund it too so Thank you for that. Also, this, this also gives the opportunity to take your own organizations and do a deeper dive into yeah. each one of them. And so as people are listening to a podcast that they may have chimed in because they're interested in the Rockwell Museum, and then all of a sudden, then they start hearing about, you know, Noni Hood. Parent Resource Center, or they start hearing about the orchestra, the Southern Finger Lakes, or whatever. That is awesome. I just, I just think, and and back to the main question, Jeff, you were saying about board recruitment. You know, you're reaching a younger audience. They might become more interested in the in the in the uh, you know your mission and want to be a part of it because of the podcast. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, <clears throat> if if we do an episode featuring Tanglewood uh, this week, and then, you know, six months from now we do, we've done 10 other episodes and they're featuring Finger Lakes Wine Country and the Rockwell Museum and Arbor Housing and Development. Um, that doesn't mean that Tanglewood can't say, hey, here's an episode from six months ago. If you're interested in our organization, um, here's the direct link to it. And uh, take a listen, because I think you'll get a pretty good idea of who we are. Um, just because there have been a lot of other episodes doesn't mean that the old ones ever go away either. So you've always got 
those deep dives where, you know, we don't have to talk about every organization and every episode, but as a whole, everyone gets uh, this, these new resources that they can use um, and you're tied to that whole bigger conversation. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that I, I think a collective effort makes sense too from a, <clears throat> an appetite standpoint from our audience. You know, if every nonprofit created a podcast, it's, it's just going to become saturated and we wouldn't have the listeners. Um, so, you know, combining our efforts and being able to have a lot more stories to tell, I think is, is logical. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. I, it's just, I think, you know, the thing that kind of clicked to me is, is that, um, you know, so, so I'm thinking, all right, so how is this, how would a podcast with nonprofits talk about who they are and what they do different than what else exists out there? And so I, you know, I know that the television stations, you know, do these community things and they have different people on and, you know, they run them at 630 in the morning or nine o'clock on a Sunday morning and that's it. I mean, you know, maybe they'll run it later, but you know, it, it's not, they're not easily accessible. And so this, you know, podcast would be obviously easily accessible to anyone at any time to listen to. You don't have to wait to sit in front of a television station. The other thing that, um, that kind of, I wonder if, if part of the focus is, you know, so we're talking about individual groups, which I think is great in terms of what we do, but I think there's a really a lack of understanding in the community at large of what nonprofits are. I mean, you know, the reality is we are 5013 corporations. Um, we have corporate structures that we have to adhere to, and we're not much different than for-profit structures in many ways in terms of our requirements. I think there's a, this is an opportunity to talk about those kinds of things um, that, you know, as I'm looking at the, I, we definitely need a funky fresh spin on it from Lisa Karachi. I'm not sure I'm um, talking about the corporate structure of nonprofits is very funky, but it's something that really, I think is critical that people, you know, they think, well, you, you know, you, you can't make money and you don't make money and you put your hand out, you know, asking for this and that and not really under, or you serve or you serve the homeless or you help people go out, but not really understanding the concept. And I would think that, you know, creating um, those opportunities to talk about those things that go, that those deeper dives, not just to the organization, but the structure would be important as well. Yeah, the thing the, the Community Foundation focuses on with theirs is making philanthropy accessible because the idea, the perception is that philanthropy belongs to rich people, but uh, it doesn't. You know, and there are so many ways into philanthropy, um, whether it's through volunteering, through doing, through picking up trash in your neighborhood, through anything, um, and it's sort of redefining what that word means. So, the orchestra would be interested in participating in this, and we'd love to provide the uh, intro music or the exit music as well. Yes. <laughs> oh. Um, also, you know, I, I agree with what Jeff said that um, this, it, it's a great platform to not only represent what each of us as organizations do and what the nonprofit um, category basically is all about, but this um, kind of ties in with one of the other topics that we had for this morning, I think, which is um, since this is something that's focusing on our community, uh, this is a great place to point potential board members to, to learn about mm -hmm. what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And we know it's a small enough community that we all share board members. <laughs> yes, and we need to cultivate uh, new, mm -hmm. uh, new people in that mm -hmm. uh, circle of board members that we all share. <laughs> so yeah. this would be a great way to do that. Yeah. Karen. Yeah, I, so I, um, there have been a number of chat comments. Um, <laughs> no, Lisa, we're not sharing bloopers. Um, <laughs> so there have been a number of chat Beth, comments. You're so boring. Come on. I know. I know. My, 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 fam my family tells me that all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so somebody um, in one of our, our leadership meetings, one of our staff said, um, uh, that our, our COO um, was much more uh, 
cheerful or whatever than I am. So I just, you know, anyway, so sorry, Lisa. Um, that's, that's why we're coach. That's why we're co-sharing this right now. So I was just going to say, we make a perfect pair then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, the odd couple. So there've been, there've been a number of chats, um, comments that folks are, um, and some folks have had to jump off. Uh, but I don't, I, I think it's, um, it's a very positive response to these that folks are really into this. Now the trick is how do we, how do we put it together and how do we do that? And can we get a sponsor to cover some of those costs or how do we cover those costs? I think those are conversations we can have as well. I, I think part of, from my perspective, the, in Karen, you reference this in terms of, you know, recruiting board members, this is an important conversation for us to have. Um, because what, what we now want to do is, all right, you know, we're talking about our stories and how do we tell our stories and get those out? You know, how do we do that around the, the concept of fundraising and recruiting attractive board members? And, you know, you know one of the, one of the, one of the comments or concepts here is, you know, we're using technology, um, we're using resources that younger folks are going to pay attention to. Uh, so, you know, that that's right there is, a, is, is you, know, hope, you know, perhaps a, um, you know, a, a good approach in terms of you know, attracting board members, but younger board members. And so um, I think, you know, having this conversation and flushing it out is great. I think the plan is over the next couple of months is we want to kind of we kind of add on to how do we tell our story and how do we do it around fundraising and how do we do it around recruiting board members and how do we do it from a perspective of equity in terms of, you know, there are a lot of conversations in terms of this whole conversation around race, equity, diversity, inclusion. How do we do that? So when we take a look at our board, um, it's not all middle-aged or older white men or it's, you know, whatever. And so, so there's a, there's a, there's diversity not only in our organizations in terms of staff, but also diversity on our boards. And so I think, you know, those are the other pieces we want to kind of layer into this and kind of build off what we had last month um, with Judy, but kind of bring that back in at some point, those concepts and ideas as we continue to move forward. So uh, this is really exciting, uh, exciting stuff. And so Lisa, why I may not show it, um, I am really excited about this. It, your your enthusiasm is catching, catching, <laughs> contagious. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> I've only had one cup of coffee, guys. <laughs> See, there was a blooper right there. <laughs> so um, I think you know, for the for the I, I guess two things. One, you know, we have a few minutes. I think we'd like to go around and say, you know, what's happening in all of the worlds. How how is everybody doing? Um, I think there's a sense of what we're talking about makes sense. Um, we should continue it. I guess the other part, Denise, is what do you think are the next steps and what would we need to do to try to create this um, nonprofit podcast? So maybe we can start with that and then we'll kind of go around the, the Brady Bunch squares and kind of talk about what's going on. Yep. Well, since Sean volunteered himself, <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be great if Lisa, Jeff, and Sean and I can get together and kind of talk about what what would be included, what do we need, and then kind of develop a preliminary plan which we can bring back to the group and, and share. Yeah, it kind of needs a brand. Yeah. yeah but not can I make the in logo? Not to get into the weeds on this right now, but just a consideration for the, the group and as this idea is moving forward is thinking about the podcast from a, you know, a storytelling platform versus a fundraising platform. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's going to be some organic uh, contributions that would hopefully come out from this, from the storytelling. But, um, you know, especially as it's representing the, the collective group, I think, you know, keeping it a storytelling platform would probably... But anyway, that's a bigger conversation, but just to, I didn't want to lose lose that. Yeah, no, I think it's it's an important point, correct? Yeah. Thank you. If, if it's all fundraising, they'll tune out in a heartbeat. Right. So yeah. You're right, Brett. And I think, you know, Sean knows and he can work with, with Denise and Jeff and, and Lisa about structure. So the best podcasts have a structure. Mm -hmm. They they that you get into a rhythm, and that rhythm is the same every every time, whether it's weekly or whatever, even with Sean's podcast, you know, it, you kind of know where he's going. There's, you know, 
three rough sections basically. And, and so if there's an area, you know, where you guys are planning, where it's an introductory and then it's stories of help or who, you know, what, what, what are the, the, the heartwarming stories and then something else, something else, then the listeners start to understand what to expect. It's kind of like our favorite um, newscasters that have sign-offs um, that we get into the habit of hearing. Um, and, and if we can get into a pattern, then that pattern allows each of us when we are asked, you know, Elaine says, okay, it's time for time to talk about Tanglewood. She knows exactly what she's got to pull together before Sean or whoever is the host starts asking the questions. So it's, it's not a difficult process. It's just starting it from the beginning. And like Lisa, you were saying, having a brand. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, we have kind of a plan, Denise, that will pull together a group and say, how do we flush this out and do that? That's excellent. Um, on behalf of Lisa and Denise, thank you everyone for um, joining and for the conversation. Sean, thank you very much um, for your presentation. It was excellent. I think it was exactly what we needed and uh, we will be talking to you. Everyone, thank you very much. Um, presuming we can pull all this off in three weeks, we will we'll try to do that if, and, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll be communicating with folks. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. Be safe, everyone. Take care.